Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Before I begin a talk, uh, we came across this really amazing presentation on Srila Prabhupada's crossing the Atlantic in a and so it's a slide form, the, the whole thing is visual with a narration accompanying the visual presentation. So I thought before I speak, we could play that. It's a lot about what we heard in the reading, but now you can see the actual places that Prabhupada went, how the journey unfolded, and some of the more detailed aspects that were part of Srila Prabhupada's arduous and most impossible journey across the ocean. So before I speak, I think we can, you know, I think everyone's ready up there for that? Yeah. Okay, so it takes, it's about 25 minutes, but it's really interesting. So I'll, I'll sit on, on the side and watch it along with you. We'd have to admit that's what this just was given to us as the history of Srila Prabhupada's coming is something that is incredibly impossible. <laughs> Especially when you think about it, he did. He started at the age of he had his 69th birthday when he was on the ship. Imagine such age, but determination fixed on the order of his spiritual master, enduring so many let me see, reverses, hardships, difficulties, practically on the verge of death. But still, he pushed on. And one thing we can understand from that, he completely and totally, utterly depended on Krishna. <laughs> and. Uh, with that utter dependence on Krishna, he had full faith that he would be successful. <laughs> and at the very end, we see that that poem that Prabhupada penned, Markin Bhagavad Dharma, he ends after, in a very humble, selfless, completely dependent mood that I am designated as Bhakti Vedanta, but I have no knowledge, nor do I have any devotion. But I do have full faith in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. There's an, an incident after Srila Prabhupada had appeared in the West where one of his God brothers who also made an attempt to leave India and preach the message of Krishna consciousness in the Western world. He had gone to London. There was others that had gone to Germany, Burma. They all come back they all came back with some contacts of people that they had met but no real success, nothing was established. And so there was a discussion mm -hmm. by one of Srila Prabhupada's god brothers, Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj. Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj was, we could say without any slight, you know, uh, Distraction, distraction from the definition of the word absorbed. He was fully absorbed in chanting the holy name. <laughs> 24 hours a day he would chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra or do bhajans in glorification of the holy name and in glorification of Krishna in different ways. And he had such an intimate and very friendly, open, very relaxed relationship with Srila Prabhupada. And they would talk. Well, one time he was talking to one of the one of the uh, 
devotees, Prabhupada's god brother, who had gone to the west, and and he said to him, in a more of a rhetorical way, he said, uh, "You went to you went to the west, and Bhakti Vedanta Swami went to the west. You are also a great scholar on Vedic knowledge." You know the scriptures well and also can speak. And Bhaktivedanta, he is also deep in understanding scriptures and can present it. You failed and he succeeded. Why? <laughs> it was a challenge. <laughs> there was no response from this, uh, this god brother. But then Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj gave the answer. He said, Bhaktivedanta Swami was successful because he had full faith in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> and we could see that when Srila Prabhupada was established in his, somewhat established in his early days in New York. He, uh, what did he do? He took his few fledging followers, people that had come to some of his meetings. He had he was holding meetings in uh, 26 Second Avenue, and he was uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday nights. He would give discourses on Bhagavad Gita, and then at one point, uh, a drum arrived, <laughs> and uh, we spoke about that last night about how that drum was actually the beginning of the Hare Krishna movement. That drum sits on the altar of Nuvrindavan in Prabhupada's palace. The same drum is there. It was a little tom-tom drum. You just hold it in one arm and you kind of play it. <laughs> that, and that drum, Prabhupada received that drum by mail. And uh, he had asked for a murdanga, but he didn't receive any murdanga. Murdanga actually came later. And uh, so taking his fledging new uh, disciples or followers, they went to Thompson Square Park and Prabhupada would beat on the drum and sing and the devotees would sing and dance. <laughs> and that was the beginning in a very graphic way of how Krishna consciousness really took off. So you can see how Prabhupada emphasized in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as being his means for spreading Krishna consciousness. Who is Srila Prabhupada? <laughs> it's uh, something that is a great mystery to all of us. We know one thing that he was sent on this mission by the Supreme Lord himself to spread eternal religious principles in a world that was somewhat going. We heard from yesterday, Radhanath Maharaj was describing how the world was at a very precarious place where war, tension, cold war, a hot war could explode at any moment. And uh, it, that, was the, that was the time, and Prabhupada came at that time. And it was just perfect, because by bringing eternal religious principles, somehow by his presence and his preaching, it spread and things started to change, at least to a certain degree. But we go back a little bit into the scriptures and there's one statement from, I believe it's the Brihan, not from the Brihad Narada, from the Brahmanda Pramana, Pramana, Purana, I'm sorry, Brahmanda Purana, which says that um, it's a statement by Sri Krishna himself and he's making this statement and he's talking to, um, I believe, Lord Brahma. He said, in the future, uh, a personality will come and he will be my mantra upasaka and he will spread my name throughout the globe. Uh, that's a paraphrase of an, the actual essence of that. And that's from, that's from Krishna himself that was spoken at least 
more than 5,000 years ago, or even even before that. But that's when the Purana was actually giving that message. So Krishna actually predicted, or not predicted, but Krishna actually foretold us ahead of time that a great soul would soon appear in the world to spread the glories of Hare Krishna everywhere. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Narada Muni, there's also a, st a nice ex statement where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was saying that my Sanapati Bhakta, <laughs> um, that Sanapati means the general, the best of all the Bhaktas, the leader of all the Bhaktas, will appear in the world and he will spread religious principles everywhere and anywhere and he will those persons who are leaving Bardvarsya to wander everywhere, he will collect them. This is somewhat of a paraphrase. In other words, uh, what that verse is, what that statement is saying is that, that Prabhupada would go everywhere, traveling throughout the world, and finding candidates to bring them to Krishna consciousness. So that statement is made by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Later on, there was a third statement by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, where he says, soon a great personality will appear in the world and he will spread Krishna consciousness everywhere. <laughs> so these statements were all prior to Srila Prabhupada's appearance in the world and bringing about the understanding that uh, Krishna's will was going to manifest in a, a great personality. And Prabhupada, although Prabhupada apparently struggled so hard, and not apparently he did, he understood he had a mission. He understood that. Uh, it says that even prior, even prior to Prabhupada coming to the West, he was thinking, where should I go? Uh, he said, my god brothers, they went to London, they went to Germany, they went to My Myanmar, which was Burma at the time, and they all failed. Maybe I should, I should go to another place, so let me fail in another place. <laughs> Prabhupada said that. And then Prabhupada said, I was dreaming. I was dreaming I was going to New York. In fact, in my dream, I was even feeling I had made it to New York. <laughs> So Prabhupada focused because he saw that, that this particular part of the world was the epicenter of Kali Yuga. <laughs> and Prabhupada said that also, that New York City was 50 years ahead of, in the rest of the world of Kali Yuga. So <laughs> just in case you want to go visit, that's a <laughs> you can get Kali Yuga in, you know, you know panoramic colors, you know, it's just... So, yeah, those of you who have been there or lived there, you have an understanding. It's still like that. But Prabhupada picked, when we say the most, uh, what we say, degraded place you could possibly go. And uh, he began his movement. And Prabhupada said, I was always looking for first class men, but Krishna never sent any first class. I was looking for second, first, second, no first class, only third and fourth class at best. <laughs> so, you know, Prabhupada had to n not only, you know, try to present the Vedic scheme, the knowledge, the practice into a foreign country, but he also had to present it to persons who were really quite degraded in their you know, lifestyle. But it was a time of looking for something new, something better, rejecting all the old ways, seeing what we were living in a certain way and we threw all of that out, thinking that all of these restrictions, all of these rules, all of these requirements in life were simply a burden. Life became bohemian, uh, you know. You know, tune in, turn on, drop out. And that was the message <laughs> in the, the Lower East Side. In other words, drugs were the, the focus and, you know, 
any kind of activity uh, with any kind of person was acceptable. And so, um, yeah, so this is what Prabhupada walked into. But he was never discouraged. He, said, you know, he could understand that, you know, he tried. First he went to the upper west side of New York and he spent some time with one doctor. He was actually a scholar, Dr. Mishra. And he had an ashram there of some interested Westerners who were coming to hear about, when we say, Indian philosophy, Indian culture. But Dr. Mishra was a staunch impersonalist. <laughs> and somehow or other, Prabhupada connected with him. And in that connection, Dr. Mishra was very cordial, invited uh, our Srila Prabhupada to come and stay, come to his presentations. And sometimes even Dr. Mishra would ask Prabhupada to speak. And when Dr. Mishra would speak, he would speak all kinds of, you know, impersonalist, Mayavadi ideas. And when Prabhupada would speak, he would pretty much tear apart what Dr. Mishra would say, <laughs> right in his own ashram. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they would argue. Um, but somehow, well, because there was, there's, there was something else there, they, they stayed together for some time. Actually, one of the, the one of the young men who was coming at that time, who was there, he he actually uh, later on came to Srila Prabhupada's shelter because of that. But Prabhupada couldn't do much there. He actually saw it was impossible for him to pre present the personal understanding of the absolute truth, the actual complete understanding in such an environment. So after some time. And that relationship changed, then Prabhupada moved into another area. But during that time, when Dr. Mishra was sick, Srila Prabhupada cooked for him. And Prabhupada's cooking was not only so tasty, but actually very medicinal. Dr. Mishra was actually very grateful to Srila Prabhupada because by his cooking, Srila Prabhupada became healthy. I mean, Dr. Mishra again became healthy. So the, the relationship was sweet, but obviously Prabhupada could not stay in such an environment where impersonalism was, was being presented as the absolute truth. And then, of course, Prabhupada's struggle in New York City. There were so many, many difficulties. His typewriter was stolen. His... Um, his tape recorder was stolen. Um, he was living in one apartment house that somebody had m arranged for him. And when his typewriter and tape recorder was stolen, he came back and he realized they were gone. Prabhupada knew who stole it. It was the person who was managing the apartment house, the janitor. But he had no proof, but he could on a sense that this person was the person who had stolen his possessions. And that was everything, and also some of the work that he was working on at that time. So we see how many reverses. Why does Krishna allow such difficulties to happen to such a person who is sincere, pure in heart, and dedicated to his mission? And sometimes we get a little bit uh, confused or bewildered by how is it? It should be, everything should be smooth. He's a pure devotee. He's surrendered. There's no question of anything. But you see, just like how much the Pandavas had to go through when they had to, and although in the presence of Sri Krishna himself, uh, they were attacked, tempted to be killed in so many different ways, uh, vilified, criticized, ousted, so many difficulties. And they were intimate associates of Sri Krishna himself. Krishna was personally there. Bhishma Dev, when he, when he started to reflect on what the Pandavas had to go through, he was practically in tears. 
explaining how they were so closely connected to Krishna, but so many, many horrible situations came upon them in such a way that it threatened their lives and even their reputation. But still, but this is Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Sometimes we get a little bit concerned. That, you know, if I, if I uh, become a devotee of the Lord, will I have to go through so many difficulties in my life? This is the way the material world is. It's just the way it is. It's difficult. But Krishna is always protecting his devotee, although he may allow for the material energy to, to give the devotee some difficulties, some challenges, some reverses in life. But the devotee always becomes glorious. And, some, and Krishna does that also to show that these persons will do anything and surrender their lives simply to worship, to um, serve me. In other words, he glorifies his devotees by allowing all of these things to happen. Because he knows the devotee is always fully dependent on him and Krishna is always there, ultimately to give protection. And that's, that's, a, that's a scenario that happens. I mean, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati makes a very, what we say, uh, a statement that would scare most people away. <laughs> From. He says that he says that engage, devotional service, uh, engaging in devotional services, is like traversing a forest path full of thorns. <laughs> in other words, there are obstacles. There are difficulties. There are reverses, there are even disappointments, there are even reasons to give up. But all of these are seen from the clear from the under from the proper understanding as opportunities to become more dependent on Krishna, to become more surrendered to Krishna, to become more uh, when we say enthusiastic to engage in devotional service. Because ultimately, uh, the process of devotional service will lead one back home, back to Godhead. That's, that's guaranteed. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Taktua Deham Purna Janmani Naiti Mam Eti Surajuna. So there is never reason for discouragement, although reverses can cause one to become somewhat concerned or bewildered. But one who takes shelter of Krishna's holy name, like Srila Prabhupada writes, he says, sometimes in your practice of Krishna consciousness, your enthusiasm has taken a decline, or it's maybe even lost. Your desire to continue on in your service somehow or other becomes lost due to circumstances or due to something that happened. Papa said, never get discouraged. He said, just sit down anywhere, at, at specifically in one of our temples, and just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> he said, by doing that, you just chant, 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 and, and after some time, everything will be back. <laughs> the holy name of the Lord is the panacea to overshadow all of the difficulties in this age. And Srila Prabhupada put a lot of emphasis on that. In 1949, Srila Prabhupada wrote one article called the Gita Nagari Conception. This was prior to his coming to the West. And he was also, during those days, we go back to the history of the unfolding of Srila Prabhupada's life, he was planning his mission ahead of time, preparing for when it was time to actually unfold his program. And he wrote this Gita Nagari conception. And he illustrated and emphasized Mahatma Gandhi. 
Prabhupada liked what, what some of the programs that Gandhi had embarked upon in order to practice both spiritual life and to develop the villages in India. And Prabhupada made, made four points based on, this, uh, on Gandhi's understanding. And he uses Gandhi as an example. He said, although Gandhi had so many responsibilities, still he always had time to read and study Bhagavad Gita. He always had time for his prayers. He would never neglect those. And Prabhupada makes this and expands on this point that uh, this reading, studying, and understanding scripture um, was one of the first principles that he first inaugurated in bringing Krishna consciousness to us. And that was, we see in the very beginning of the movement, Prabhupada started to write articles. He had written uh, Easy Journey to Other Planets in 1959, I believe it was. And uh, many articles. And Prabhupada, as we heard earlier, Prabhupada was always writing. <laughs> He was writing, 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 writing. He, 1944, he had started in his Back to Godhead uh, magazine, which wasn't even a magazine at that time. It was just two, two or three pieces, actually just one piece of paper, both sides, two pages, giving some understanding of Krishna consciousness in a very direct way. So Prabhupada always saw the importance of the, the, the written word Prabhupada said, um, everything that I want you to understand as far as the practice and the, uh, and, the re and the understanding of Krishna consciousness, I put in my books. Prabhupada gave his, his lectures. Prabhupada gave, had room conversations with many of devotees and also others. Prabhupada did morning walks. He did so many things and he said so many things. But sometimes we sometimes we find that there is apparent conflict in what Prabhupada said at one time and what he said at another time. Not only conflict, it appears to be different. But that is reconciled when we go to his books. <laughs> and everything is in the books. <laughs> so if you read, Prabhupada said, if you want to understand me, read my books. <laughs> he said, I'm in my books. Everything I've, I've, I wanted to present to all of you is in my books, and if I say something more, then that's not. In other words, when he said that, in other words, there would be more coming. But he said, everything I gave, I gave is in my books. So emphasizing that point in this Gita Nautica conception pointed to, to Gandhi as a person who really took Shastra very seriously and made it a very important part of his daily life. And Prabhupada initiated that as one of the beginning step, steps is to write books and to print books and to distribute books. And he made that one of his first beginning of his mission along with chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. These two things became the focus of the spreading of Krishna consciousness. And that's what took off from... Uh, 26 Second Avenue in 1965, Prabhupada inaugurated his society on July 13th, 1965, calling it the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. What was international about it? <laughs> there was nothing. It had one storefront with a, a small group of individuals who were interested and very much uh, like Srila Prabhupada, they were coming, they were hearing. He was also engaging them in some practical activities in the center. And at the same time, he was preaching, 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 giving so many lectures and also beginning his Harinam in Thompson Square Park. So he emphasized these two things, the books and the holy names. And that became point one. If you go and see the old Back to Godhead magazines, that were printed in the early days, especially uh, the beginning ones, it's all you see is articles on philosophy and 
Harinams. Harinam here, Harinam there, Harinam's there, Harinam's there. That's how the movement unfolded. He sent devotees from different places around the world. Where did they do? They, they took a few books. And in those days, there wasn't many. In fact, uh, I remember even, even before the books were available, devotees were distributing back to Godhead magazines. That was the only form of, of Shastra we had in those days. In fact, when I joined in 19, no, I didn't even join, I didn't even join in that. In 1970, I was at an anti-war rally in uh, Washington, D.C. I had gone as part of one of the participants in, in speaking against the war. It's a little bit of my background. And I went and uh, I saw the devotees for the first time at the, uh, the Washington Monument. I was thinking, who are these people? They're dressed quite unusual. They got this strange haircut. <laughs> uh, but they look they look kind of nice. They were singing and they were dancing. They were also giving out these little leaflets. And one, I don't even remember her name, she approached me. She gave me a little flyer and then and then she handed me a magazine, and she said, um, this is for you, two sticks of incense. Um, oh, I said, that's very nice. And I, she said, give a donation. And so I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out 50 cents, which was pretty good in those days. <laughs> she said, no, two dollars. <laughs> so I said, oh. <laughs> so I felt like I was, you know, getting overpriced. <laughs> but I gave her the two dollars and then she gave me this little pamphlet, Who is Crazy? And Krishna, the Supreme Personality, Krishna, the Reservoir of All Pleasure. Yeah. These were a little combination of two articles Prabhupada had written. I put it in, I was, uh, I had to take a bus ride back to where I was living in New Jersey at the time. I uh, read the whole pamphlet, didn't understand anything. <laughs> Put it in my drawer along with the incense, and two years later I met the devotees again. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, you, we see how these, you know, Prabhupada's program for distributing transcendental literature always has some effect in, in due course of time. So Prabhupada began the movement then and then he started to open up places of worship. And again, in his Gita Nagari conception, he writes very extensively, again, pointing to Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Mahatma Gandhi would always also visit the temple regularly and worship his deities of Radha and Krishna. In fact, he even installed one, in Prabhupada names one place called Nokaili, Nokaili, where, uh, where Gandhi uh, actually uh, started to worship and he also installed deities there. So again, Prabhupada saw this was an expansion of his mission now to establish temples and bring the worship of Radha and Krishna. And you can see if you uh, reflect all around the world how many temples of Radha and Krishna we have, numerous temples. I can tell you an interesting story. This goes back to when Prabhupada, after Prabhupada was in America, and he was still in the Bowery, 26th Second Avenue. And this is actually even before things started to develop. Prabhupada was sitting on a park bench one day. It was in some day, sometime during the day. And one Iranian, uh, was a tram driver, he was a driver of a train or subway driver, I don't know, one of those, uh, you know, for moving passengers around, I think it's tram driver or something. Anyway, he, he saw Srila Prabhupada sitting on the bench. He was thinking, this person looks interesting, Prabhupada was dressed, and 
So he sat on the same bench with Srila Prabhupada. And then he started to ask him, well, who are you? Where have you come from? Why are you here? And Prabhupada started talking a little bit about himself, explaining he had come to bring uh, spiritual knowledge to the Western world. And then Prabhupada started to talk. And at one point Prabhupada said, and I have 108 temples, but they're separated by time. So this is a total stranger who's hearing this. So this person, later on we understood, he reflected on what Prabhupada said and he thought, this person is very nice, but he's speaking really crazily. He has 108 temples and a 70 year old man sitting in on a bench. But it's interesting because I received a letter maybe about 25 years ago from a person who was in jail. And he wrote to me, he said, Maharaj, something interesting happened when I was staying at the Seattle Temple in Washington. He said, I was there as a devotee and that same Iranian person, he's now much older, he came into the temple, he walks up to Srila Prabhupada's deity and starts speaking really emotionally. And he said, and he was speaking out loud, he said he's going to do it, he did it, I didn't think he was going to do it. So that same Iranian person who met Srila Prabhupada, later found out that Srila Prabhupada actually did it. <laughs> Krishna arranged for that person to get that knowledge. Because when Prabhupada says something, it happens. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so that's an interesting little, uh, you know, situation where the same person who doubted Prabhupada and then just parted company, so many years later, he came to a temple and he uh, he understood, yeah, Prabhupada did it. So, yeah, so that was the second part of Srila Prabhupada's mission is to start um, temples everywhere in the world and install deities of Radha and Krishna, Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra, Sri Sri Gornitai, and other temples, Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuma. Prabhupada is famous for, our, at least our society is glorious. And then Prabhupada writes in this Gita Nagari conception that he wanted to do that, especially in India. Because he said that our, the Mandirs in India have now fallen into a very sad state of affairs. They are no longer people who are running the temples, people who are coming to the temples are no longer interested in glorification of the Supreme Personality of God and the temples have become places of demoniac dance. That's what he uses that word in that conception, demoniac dance. In other words, the temples had gone so far down in India that Prabhupada saw that a revival of that was necessary in order to reestablish proper temple worship and to, you know, situate people in the correct understanding. So that was, um, Prabhupada's concern was to again bring Krishna consciousness in the world by establishing so many temples. And he did. We have more than 108 temples in the world and temples are still opening up everywhere by the grace of Srila Prabhupada and the hard work of his devotees. That was the second stage of Prabhupada's mission. The third, the third stage of Prabhupada's mission was to, and he refers to mm, the Harijan movement that took place in India around the 1940s where Gandhi was saying that persons who are, when we say, outside of the, the uh, when we say, the Vanashram system, 
They're called Hari Johns. He, he gave them the name, and these are the charmers, or the, the bongis, those who live in a very, uh, what we say, uh, degenerate state of affairs, poor, without proper clothing, without proper food, um, no education. In other words, the outcasts in society. And uh, Hari and Gandhi wanted to give these people some some importance, so he laid it in Hari Johns. And Prabhupada said there are Hari Johns, but they have to be qualified to be called Hari Johns. Hari Johns means one who follows Hari or Krishna. And so a system of evaluation, education, and engagement in spiritual activities is required. And then Prabhupada, of course, made that also part, and that was the process of initiation. So that was the third part. Of course, this thing, these all thing, all of these programs happened quite simultaneously. Prabhupada gave initiations right at the very beginning, and even in 1966. But that was also a third part of his mission: is to bring for people forward, give them a chance to understand this principle by giving them transcendental knowledge, helping them understand, to practice this knowledge, to follow principles that would help them free them from the attachments and from all of the diversions that come by way of material life. In other words, the four regulative principles, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, education, and ultimately establishing the, the initiation process. So Prabhupada took that from Gandhi on the, on the idea of the Harijan movement. And he made that a point in his, his explanation in the Gita Nagari concept. And the fourth was to um, establish Ban Ashram. And he, Prabhupada saw the, uh, the abrogation of the Ban Ashram system into the caste system, where if a person was born a Brahmana, even though they didn't have qualifications of the Brahma because they were in a Brahminical family, they were automatically considered a Brahmana. So Prabhupada took issue with that and said, yeah, well, we have to establish this Van Ashram system based on Krishna's teachings. In other words, there are, you know, this is called Swadharma, one's per actual nature, but in this age, what is the what is the requirement? It's education, and so because everyone is born, especially in Kali Yuga, close Sudra Sambhavan, the scriptures say that re education is required in order to bring out the individual's qualification and then engage them. So Prabhupada wanted to establish the Van Ashram system and make it in relationship to devotional service. Therefore, he called it Daivi Vanarashram, or spiritual Vanarashram, engaging people according to their nature in Krishna consciousness, but having a system of education and evaluation which would help bring out that. But Prabhupada, that part of his mission, which he also man, mentions in his Gita Nagari article, he said, that part of my mission, when he left the world, has still not developed. So therefore, he said, establish these farm communities. He says, this, on the farm communities, we can, we can establish this. We can begin the establishment in the Van Ashram and it's a system of education. So that's the unfinished part of Srila Prabhupada's mission yet. It's, it's developing, but it hasn't really gone, what we say, to the extent where it has actually become a feature of, of the practice of Krishna consciousness. To a certain degree it's happening, but Prabhupada emphasized this evaluation system through education and, and engagement in devotional service. And the idea is that everyone, people can be engaged according to their nature, and in that way they would be fixed nicely in Krishna consciousness. That was Prabhupada's program. And he said, this is my unfinished mission, <laughs> part of my unfinished mission. So these are the different, um, these are the four points of Srila Prabhupada's mission. Um, books, Harinam, 
uh, holy names, chanting, uh, temple worship, deity worship, uh, initiation, evaluation, education, and Van Ashram. These are the four stages that Srila Prabhupada emphasized, and he did that in 1949, and gradually started to implement it through the practice of Krishna consciousness as he was preaching around the world. So, um, yeah, this is a little bit about uh, Srila Prabhupada. Uh, this movement is really uh, coming from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. Prabhupada is just one of the many great personalities in the line, but he is a significant one that took Krishna consciousness all around the world. Prabhupada talks about that himself when one of his disciples uh, had noted that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had taken Krishna consciousness throughout the Indian subcontinent. When we read in Chaitanya Charitamrita how Lord Chaitanya, also in Chaitanya Bhagavat, went everywhere and spread the holy name everywhere. He traveled for six years, left Jagannath Puri, went down the uh, eastern coast of India all the way down to Cape Cormoran, came back up to where Mumbai is today. And from that area, he crossed back over and went back to Jagannath Puri. That took him six years. He spread the, the holy name everywhere and went to many temples, established uh, Krishna consciousness through the process of Harinam Sankirtan. And so one devotee had asked Srila Prabhupada, you know, well, Prabhupada, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was here and he practically made the whole subcontinent of India Krishna conscious. Why didn't he take it around the world? <laughs> and Prabhupada said, he left it for me to do. <laughs> yeah. so Prabhupada, in a very humble way, was saying that, you know, this is Krishna's grace. He, he, Krishna does everything, but he allows, he empowers his devotee to do everything. And this is a very important part of our whole process of Krishna consciousness, is to understand that whatever is being done is done by the mercy of Krishna coming through the determination and the efforts of his devotees. We make the efforts, we make the plans, and Krishna empowers that accordingly. And by the grace of Krishna, things transpire and Krishna consciousness spreads more and more. But it's all by the mercy of Krishna. We And Prabhupada taught that. Or Pra Krishna used Prabhupada to teach that to the world when Prabhupada had nothing, and no money, no support, ill health, so many material challenges with the material energy. And so, but he completely, and Prabhupada was always in that mood, completely dependent on Krishna. There was one. There was one little incident when Prabhupada was in America, and he was sitting in one hotel room. He was with a few of his disciples there, and he was praying. And then Prabhupada was saying, he was talking to us. He said, "I'm I'm simply praying to Krishna that I don't fall into Maya." <laughs> And well, you can think, well, why would Prabhupada pray not to fall into Maya? I mean, he's away, he's, you know, he's fully Krishna conscious. But he was also, in his natural humility, but he's also teaching us that material energy is very powerful. <laughs> it's Krishna's, uh, it's Srishti uh, Sthisti Palaya Sadeka. It can create, it can maintain, it can destroy the... The material energy is, is chayeva, it's, it's the shadow of the reality, but it is ag extremely powerful. It is one of, Krishna, one of Krishna's external energies. And so, therefore, Prabhupada was teaching us, yes, that maya is very strong. We should always be in the mood of complete dependence and mercy upon the, the holy name 
upon Krishna and upon the association of devotees. So I think it's getting to the, yeah. I can't see the clock because for some reason, what? 10 minutes to, it's 12.35 now? Okay, I think I'm supposed to stop right around this time. So thank you very much. Do we want to have questions or do we have, if there's any? Number th yeah. I think, thank you so much, Maharaj, for that. Um, we do have time for questions. So we have um, Nitya Priya, Radha Mataji, who's going to be in the audience. And yeah, we have time for, is two questions okay? Whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> we have 10 minutes, <laughs> so we can see what we can do. If anyone would. So we have, we have 10 minutes until questions, and then we'll have some children from the Gurukul coming to do a bhajan for us. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, now is your time. Please raise your hand and Masji will come over so you can say your question. We have a question here in the front, and also Rupa Vilas Prabhu. <laughs> Vaishnav humility. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you very much for the, um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for the wonderful class. And uh, I just wanted to ask one thing regarding Harinam Sankirtan. Is it true that Srila Prabhupada said that for preaching in India, Harinam Sankirtan is not recommended because people don't, like street Harinam I mean, because uh, people don't take it as... Uh, like they don't, they look down upon people singing in the streets and so like uh, I'm asking this because I come from India, I didn't see so much street Harinam there but I see it a lot here. So I was just wondering if it's actually true that it's not recommended so we don't do it or it's just that we need to do it more. We do it but not so much, occasionally and depending on where we are also. But Prabhupada said, yeah, they will see us as beggars and so. <laughs> We don't have a job and we're out there just begging. <laughs> so they will not, generally, and of course, there's people are individuals, but generally Prabhupada said that they will not take, us, take it very important or see us as beggars. So he didn't emphasize that so much, but he did emphasize book distribution, temple openings, especially in India. He wanted temples everywhere. So, I mean, if you go to certain places, if you go to our mandir in Mayapur, we do Harinam in the streets there. And so does the Gaudiya Math along with us, they're right next to us, so. But that's, that's just one small place. And, and once in a while, I've, I've done Harinam in, in Mumbai and with the devotees from Radha Gopinath one time. But I can see people were not so inspired by it. So, so Prabhupada didn't wanted to put the emphasis more on on books and temple worship. And, but in the West, you know, the Hari, Harinam is really seen as something unique, unusual, and singing and dancing is, you know, gets people out of their moods of, you know whatever they're doing, <laughs> it's like it wakes them out of their, you know, their workaholic moods. <laughs> and so we've had a lot of luck and a lot of success in, in uh, the West with Hari, a tremendous amount. And yeah. So yeah, it's just a matter of emphasizing different aspects of preaching. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, this you were referring to, and I didn't get the title exactly. Gita Nagari Conception. Conception. Yeah. Is that actually been published? Is it available? I, I have a copy. I can make it. But available. I mean, it's not been widely published or distributed, or Th there was a little like booklet, but no, it hasn't been distributed so much. 
Yeah, it was some, 1949, Prabhupada wrote that. And he outlined his, those four pro points based on Gandhi's teachings, like that. Gandhi's life, Gandhi's teachings. And then he used that as the basis for establishing his movement also. Is it possible to get a copy of it? I have one. I don't have. I don't. I don't have a hard copy. I have a. It's on my computer, uh -huh. but I can send it to you. Okay. Thank uh, you. And anybody else who wants it also. Okay. Thank you. We have time for one more question or comment. We, we got Siguru. Guru Charana Fatima. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation of the Srila Prabhupada's gifts. And I just wanted to ask, referring to the last of the Varnashram, and, um, you know, Prabhupada said it was unfinished, only 50% right, of us right, right. complete. Well, what did he mean for us devotees, you know, in, in regards to the fact that he was training us all to be Brahmins? So um, I'm just asking, what is your understanding of? how we should complete, how should we, how, how we can help to serve Srila Prabhupada in this way. In this way. capacity? Yeah. Um, well, Prabhupada said establish these farms, uh, establish simple living, cow protection, agriculture. And he started, he said the basis of these communities is agriculture. He said grow your own food and then develop that and then after that start beginning cow protection. And he said, from that we can, we can train devotees in the Van Ashram system. So Prabhupada started with, you know, Brahminical training, but he still wanted the other two Varnas, that's Kshatri and Vaishya, to be developed. And I was just talking to one devotee last night who has a clear understanding of Prabhupada, and he s said that Prabhupada wanted the second established the Vaishyas. And then he said this, the Kshatriyas would be, would be more natural for the Kshatriyas to develop once the Vaishya's culture starts to develop. And, uh, and that's a system of, of livelihood, it's a system of commerce, it's a system of banking, it's a system of, of everything that's needed for social and economic interchange along with a lifestyle. So, I just finished a book. It's going to hopefully come out very soon. It's called N N Krishna's Way, Natural Living, and it's based on Prabhupada's statements on Van Ashram. So. so, yeah, I think it's very important that we look towards that as the future of our society, especially as this Western civilization starts to deteriorate and I don't want to go into that, but it's happening right now in a very big way. So, and Prabhupada said in 1973, he said, in 50 years, this whole Western civilization will be finished. He said that in 1973. And he said, the reason why it's based on a false foundation, what is that false foundation? Money. So because it's based on money, it cannot last. See, it's not based on culture, it's not based on values, it's not it's simply based on money. Everything evolves around economics. <laughs> so therefore, it will not last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki his Holiness Chandramuli Maharaj Ki Jai.